What are the legal consequences of Israel's occupation of Palestine? The UN says the International Court of Justice must decide. Palestinians see that as a victory, while Israel calls it despicable. But will it change anything on the ground? This is Inside Story. Hello, welcome to the program. I'm Hashim Ahal Barra. The UN General Assembly ended the year 2022 by passing a resolution calling on the International Court of Justice to give an opinion on the legal consequences of Israel's occupation of Palestinian territory. The UN Assembly voted 87 to 26 with 53 abstentions to support the motion. The last time the ICJ gave an opinion on the conflict between the Israelis and the Palestinians was in 2004, ruling Israel's separation war was illegal. The top UN court deals with disputes between states, and although its rulings are binding, the court itself has no power to enforce them. Palestinian officials have welcomed the UN's decision. The Wafa News Agency reported presidential spokesman Nabil Abordeina saying the vote is evidence of the whole world's support for our people and their inalienable historical rights. And the Hamas spokesman had this to say about the resolution. This resolution is one of a long series of decisions issued by all international institutions regarding the Palestinian issue, none of which led to a practical implementation on the ground. The important thing here is that as long as the United States of America deals as a partner with Israel in its aggression against the Palestinian people, and as long as Washington provides full cover for the occupation within these international institutions, all these resolutions will remain mere ink on paper. Meanwhile, Israeli politician and Knesset member Avigdor Lieberman expressed his opinion on Twitter, saying a despicable decision that must be roundly condemned was passed at the UN. This is further proof that the state of Israel at the moment of truth will not be able to trust the international institutions. This decision is the epitome of hypocrisy and injustice. Let's bring in our guests in West Jerusalem. Daniel Sidman, an Israeli attorney specializing in the geopolitics of Jerusalem. He's also a columnist for foreign policy. Hiram Allah, Noor Ouda, columnist and political analyst. And Ilandan Billo, editor of Arab Digest and director of the GulfMatters.com, a consultancy. Welcome to the program. Daniel the United Nations General Assembly asked the International Court of Justice for an advisory opinion on Israel's occupation of Palestinian territories. Why is Israel concerned? Israel is concerned because official Israel and much of the Israeli populace is in a deep state of occupation denial. Occupation? What occupation? Uh, we are ruling over another people, the Palestinians, against their will. Uh, it is a metastasizing occupation. And we ignore the fact that it even exists. Our UN um, ambassador, Erdan, and her prime minister said, how dare you accuse us of being an occupying power? Well. The Israeli Supreme Court, the Israeli army also say we're occupying. And um, most of official Israel rejects the fact of occupation, which is exactly why we need resolutions such as this. Israel will end occupation or occupation will be the end of us. And the message sent by this UN resolution is, get real, stop ignoring reality. Mm -hmm. No, it seems that this is widely seen as more than just a diplomatic victory for the Palestinians after many, many years of uh, major setbacks, particularly for the Palestinian Authority. 
Look, I think there are two things that are happening uh, with this resolution. On the one hand, the Palestinians are uh, going on a very uh, consistent uh, uh, path of legal accountability, using all the tools available in the international system, despite international resistance, to uh, uh, kind of expose uh, what the political reality is, which is that the Israeli occupation has long surpassed the, uh, um, the legal parameters defined in international law for occupation, and it has uh, morphed into a colonial enterprise that has no intention of leaving, and that has legal ramifications um, uh, on the international community um, that is, you know, kicking and screaming and, and, and really trying its best to dissuade Palestinians from going down that route. On the other hand, um, the uh, this resolution and what will be uh, um, in front of the ICJ is a reality that will test this international system um, that for once will have to kind of spell out what, what the facts uh, on the ground are, what the legal obligations arising from those facts are, um, and kind of leave the actors that have been hypocritical and employed double standards for so long with very few options but to mm -hmm. face the reality. So far, we've seen them resisting legal qualifications of the Israeli practices as apartheid. We've seen them uh, rejecting uh, also uh, other uh, legal scholars who say that what, what we have um, uh, is not occupation, it is col settler colonialism. And now uh, the highest mm -hmm. legal uh, a body in, in, in international law will have its say, and the Palestinians will be able to uh, kind of lay it out there for the world and, and say, well, you know, show me what you've got now. Are you are you uh, really going to play by the rules or are you going to spell it out and say that Palestinians are excluded from those rules? It's, it's, uh, it's quite okay. a, a crossroad, uh, I believe. Bill, for quite some time, the Palestinians understood that the, uh, the, the dynamics of decision makings at uh, organizations such as the Security Council are quite different from the United Nations General uh, Assembly. And this is why sometimes they took most of their uh, battles to the General Assembly. Now, when you look at the vote itself, 87 votes in favor, 24 against, 53 abstaining. Could, if we are to read into this, could this be an indication that there is a momentum building towards more of a pro-Palestinian sentiment here? Well, I think uh, I think there is a momentum building. However, I think we need to apply a, a bit of caution on this. Uh, this this uh, decision will take some time to play out. Um, as we know, these things move slowly. The breakdown in the voting, I think, was interesting. Uh, you look at the countries that abstained Sweden was one of the abstainers. Uh, France, uh, Netherlands abstained. Uh, and also you look at the countries that uh, Israel has been assiduously wooing uh, with the Abrahams Accord. Uh, they all voted for the resolution. That's the Bahrainis, Sudan, uh, UAE. Uh, and of course you had the Egyptians and the Jordanians voting in support um, and the Saudis. So you could say, well, of course, that's to be expected. On the other hand, uh, Israel has invested a huge amount of effort in securing support from these authoritarian regimes. The people in the streets, they still support Palestinians and the Palestinian cause. So this is going to cause, I think, some, some issues, some tension on that front. Of course, the fact that the Americans, I'm a Canadian, I'm ashamed that the Canadian uh, voted against, uh, to be honest with you, uh, these uh, these follow fairly predictable patterns, and and, and there are no surprises there. Mm -hmm. I do think that the fury with which the uh, uh, Israelis have responded is a measure of that this time that perhaps this this vote has had more bite than than they uh, wanted to see, and they'd worked hard actually over the past. Uh, year or so to try and get more and more countries on their side. And I think uh, the number of abstentions also speaks uh, as well to difficulties ahead, particularly given the extreme right-wing uh, nature of this new Netanyahu government. Daniel, this decision, what kind of uh, challenges does it pose for uh, Prime Minister ben Benjamin Netanyahu, who took office Thursday as the head of the most far-right government in the history of Israel? By all indications, 
Netanyahu is going to make the work of those who supported this resolution much easier and make the um, job of those who oppose this uh, resolution much more difficult. Occupation, Netanyahu denies the existence of occupation at precisely the time when occupation is metastasizing. He's doubling down on it. There's an indication that this government is unaware of the manifestations of occupation and is unwilling to move in order to end it. Ironically, those who are supporting the resolution, calling for in, in, in the court to examine this, are doing a great service to the state of Israel mm -hmm. by compelling us to face reality. Those who oppose this resolution are akin to a wealthy uncle who are subsidizing our crack addiction to occupation and settlements instead of sending, taking that same money and sending us off to rehab. We need, we, Israel, need to confront the reality of occupation and its implications for us and the Palestinians. Nor what can the Palestinians hope to achieve in the future, knowing that if the ICJ is going to be asked to provide an advisory opinion on the legal consequences of Israel's occupation, settlement and annexation, knowing that this government in particular has ministers who have widely been promoting the expansion of the settlement, what, what, what happens next? Well, this government is, is, uh, has adopted annexation as official policy, not just uh, the expansion of settlements. Uh, look, th this is a long path, uh, and, and there is no easy path to Palestinian freedom. Uh, Palestinians understand that very well. They understand that countries, even those who uh, present themselves as champions of international law, have long resisted to employ that international law to uh, um, uh, realize Palestinian self-determination, which is their obligation under international law. Having said that, employing these tools is also indispensable because at the end of the day, you cannot tell uh, peoples of the South, if you will, that there is an international rule-based system, that they must adhere to it, that they will be held accountable to its rules while Palestinians are excluded from this uh, um, system. They're excluded from the uh, recourse for remedy, uh, including the ICJ. And while countries dodge uh, their obligations um, uh, in line with international law, once the ICJ renders its opinion, and it is expected to spell out what the facts are, which is that we have a settler colonial regime that is illegal under international law, and countries are obliged to take action by way of sanctions, by way of boycott, by way of, of severing normal ties with a country that is, for all intents and purposes, a pariah state. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that will have its own momentum. And Israel and its benefactors, Israel and the occupation uh, um, uh, whitewashers will have uh, very little cover, if you will, for their ongoing denial of Palestinian rights and for their ongoing complicity, really, in Israeli crimes, including annexation and persecution and apartheid. Bill, if you look at the case, this case in particular, as with all cases presented to the International uh, uh, Court of Justice, it can be resolved either by a settlement between the two parties or one of the parties dropping the case or ultimately a verdict by the ICG. How do you see the path? You said earlier it's going to be a, a complicated path. Do you, do you think that there's going to be a level of political leverage here or political influence by the United States of America in particular to try to ensure that we're not going to see anything that is going to condemn Israel? Well, I think Noah has put her finger on it. That is that this case will cause... Uh, a great deal of, uh, of uh, uh, 
public measurement of the extent to which uh, Israel has colonized uh, the West Bank, the extent to which it has invoked an apartheid policy. And, and I think too, the extent to which it is prepared to go, Netanyahu is prepared to go to sacrifice Israeli democracy in pursuit of, of this extreme agenda. Uh, I don't see either side backing down. I, I think that there will be uh, political leverage. Uh, we don't know yet uh, whether the Democrats will win next time around. Uh, it's very hard to say. Certainly, if the Republicans come back, uh, I would expect that their support for Netanyahu would be very, very strong. Uh, and of course, the support that Netanyahu already has with the Biden administration is very, very strong. But, but I do think that it becomes increasingly threadbare, uh, this claim that Israel is the only democracy in the region, a democracy that appears prepared to institute an override clause so that decisions by the Supreme Court will be overturned by a vote in the Knesset. This is a democracy that has brought in racists and criminals and homophobes of the worst order in order to keep Mr. Netanyahu out of prison. So I think that it's going to become increasingly difficult for Israel's friends, mm -hmm. and there are many still, to sustain support for such a, 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 a damaged and damaging uh, regime, uh, this regime that Netanyahu has put in place. And I think it will, unfortunately, be a very hard year for the Palestinians. I think it's going to be a hard year for Israel as well, though. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a case of things are going to have to get worse before they get better. But I think that Israel is more vulnerable now than it was before this vote was taken. Daniel, uh, Israel's historical allies have been saying for quite some time that at least in the past, there was this opportunity to have liberals, reformists within governing coalition that would give us a sense of diversity within the Israeli political landscape. Now it's a group of ultra-Orthodox political parties coming together under Benjamin Netanyahu. So what's next for, for him? What are we expecting him to, to do in the, in the near future, given this decision by the United Nations General Assembly? I believe that we are not only in the, in the situation of the unknown, we're in the situation of the unknowable. Uh, there will be those who are tempted to say, oh, you will work with Netanyahu um, and judge him um, on, on what he does. We have shared values and shared interests. Give me a break. No good is going to come from this government. This government does not share values and does not share interests with the liberal democracies and with those who are concerned with Palestinian rights. Um, this is, um, it's tempting to say, well, let's give it time. It may not be as bad as it looks. That's true. It won't be as bad as it looks. It will probably be worse. We just do not know how. We are deep in the period of the unknowable, and we have to gird our loins and prepare ourselves for a new normal, uh, moving the dial. Uh, um, even before this government, uh, 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 occupation was becoming apologetic and aggressive, and at times fatal, lethal, uh, we will see more of that. And we have to see how does that work? How can this government be contained, engaged? And how can we bring before the Israeli public the mm -hmm. perils of perpetual occupation, not only to Palestinians, but to ourselves, to our children, to our grandchildren? No. Uh, over the last few years, I mean, Palestinians have been saying that they basically have been betrayed by their Arab neighbours, that they have been betrayed by the international community, and most particularly by the uh, United States of America. If you look at this particular case, there, there's a chance it's going to go to a verdict, but then, as you know, the ICG has no powers of enforcement, which means that the Palestinians will have to, whatever happens, to go to the Security Council. But that's where 
you have another problem, which is basically the Palestinians consider mm. the General the Security Council to be a major stumbling block, an, or, a, an entity which has never been sympathetic towards the Palestinians. Yeah, you're right. Uh, but I don't think that, uh, you know, uh, going to the Security Council is the only option. And I, you know, I want to remind uh, the viewers of uh, apartheid South Africa. Um, and I'm not drawing a, a direct parallel, but what I want to uh, remind everybody of uh, is that um, all these countries uh, that now sing the praise of uh, Nelson, the late Nelson Mandela, and talk about championing uh, the uh, uh, um, taking down of uh, the system of apartheid, actually resisted fiercely uh, to to support. Uh, 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 the dismantling of apartheid, and they were the last to join that uh, bandwagon of, of the righteous, if you will. Um, and Nelson Mandela was considered a terrorist by the United States and by Great Britain and by all these uh, major international Western democracies until that was not politically feasible anymore. I don't think we should expect anything different when it comes to Israel. Having said that, um, the way this legal this legal battle is going, um, you know, inch by inch, it is incremental and it's painstaking and it's gut wrenching and it will cost even more Palestinian blood and tears. But that is where all these countries are being pushed to. That's the corner where they'll be, mm -hmm. where the, where they can't deny facts anymore. So Security Council or not, mm -hmm. once the verdict is out, there will be a different kind of momentum in the parliaments of Western democracies that respect themselves, that have to face the facts and try to find a way to be consistent with their actions in uh, similar situations, with their own laws, which they're now violating, in order to stand with Israel and give it political cover and make it, uh, um, you know, a country above the law. That Israeli mm -hmm. exceptionalism will be hard to maintain okay. uh, once a legal definition of Israeli colonialism is handed down. Uh, Bill, let's 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 look at the bigger picture. The the international community, the Americans said that they were looking forward to see peace talks resume between the Palestinians and the Israelis. Those talks broke down in 2014. You have now Israel with its most far right government. How do you see the future? More uncertainty, more fears of instability. Well, I think the future is is uncertain. As Daniel said, we are entering into the realm of the unknown and the unknowable. Um, I, I do think there is going to be much more instability. I do think that the pressure uh, will increase as a result of this vote. I think that increasingly Israel uh, will find itself condemned, I hope, because if liberal democracy is anything and it has any value, then it will step forward finally and condemn what uh, Israel is as a state is doing. I think it's a very it's a very difficult road. And we've already heard from uh, King Abdullah in Jordan. He said there are red lines. Uh, you know, if, if there's an attempt to change the status of the holy sites in Jerusalem, that's a red line for him. There are many people in the region amongst the, them mm -hmm. authoritarians who are very close to the uh, Israelis and close to Netanyahu who do not want to see instability. I think that will be a pressure point as well. I hope that these various forces will combine to uh, cause Israel to think again. And this is what this decision is saying. Thank think you. again. You are an occupying force. You are destroying not only Palestinian lives, you're destroying what is left of Israeli democracy. Well, and surely how? people in Israel will, will, will pick up that challenge and speak up as well. I hope they will. Thank you. Unfortunately, we'll have to leave it there. Noor Ouda, Daniel Sidman below. I really appreciate your insight. Looking forward to talking to you in the near future. Thank you. And thank you too for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. For further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Hashim Al-Bara and the entire team here in Doha. Bye for now.